Welcome to Green Bites, Sustainable Asia's weekly environmental news podcast. I'm Koa Tran. And I'm Bonnie Ao. In less than 10 minutes, we offer you bite sized green updates in Asia we think you should know about. Welcome back. This week, we talk about greenwashing at the Tokyo Olympics, how disproportionate climate news coverage can affect vulnerable areas in the world, and a trolling ban in Indonesia. So, Bonnie, have you been watching the Olympics? Of course I have. Hong Kong has won its first gold medal since the handover. That was in foil fencing, and we also got two silver medals in swimming too. Exciting stuff all around. What about you, Koa? What teams have you been following? Usually the underdogs, but as a big fan of climbing, I'm more curious to watch this sport being introduced. The reason we've brought up the Olympics though is not just because they've been all over the news, but because there is an environmental side to them as well. The Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games were hyped to be the greenest games so far. Remember when they promoted the medals made from recycled metals extracted from electronics? Let's also not forget the recycled materials being used to make the podiums, athlete beds, and the torches. And while it is interesting to see the degree of thought put into it, NGO investigations have found that the plywood sourced for constructing new sports venues in Tokyo were sourced from unsustainable sources, violating the Tokyo Olympic Sustainable Sourcing Code. According to a joint statement from NGOs, including Rainforest Action Network, Environmental Investigation Agency, and Friends of the Earth Japan, about 40% of the logs used to produce plywood in 2017 came from tropical forests that had been cleared and converted for the development of coal mines and oil palm plantations. In the statements, they also mentioned Sumitomo Forestry, which had supplied the Indonesian plywood, acknowledged that it had provided conversion timber to both the Ariaka Arena and the new national stadium and it was also confirmed by the Tokyo Metropolitan Government. Apart from accusations from environmental organizations, some have also been wondering whether the hype on the use of recycled materials is simply greenwashing. Research from Dr. Sven Daniel Wolf of the University of Lausanne in Switzerland shows an overall decrease in so-called sustainability at the Olympics between 1992 and 2020. Wolf and others have measured economic efficiency ecological impact, and social justice of each Olympic game. They concluded that corporate profits and a drive to showcase grander spectacles are still what power the Olympics, despite all the messages about the environment. And speaking of corporate profits, let's take one of the Tokyo Olympics' major sponsors as an example. This company has drawn criticism for its views on how we should transition to cleaner energy. We're talking here about the Japanese car manufacturer, Toyota, who has been in recent months opposing a full transition to electric vehicles. While other automakers have pushed for fully electric cars, Toyota is taking the view that the green transition should gradually take place with gas electric hybrid vehicles, like its prized Toyota Prius, which is still occupying an important role. This has led the company to oppose stricter car emission standards in markets such as the US, UK, European Union, and Australia. On top of hybrid vehicles, Toyota is betting that hydrogen fuel cell cars can also play a larger role in this green transition. We're talking here about a costly technology that just isn't widely available in terms of refueling infrastructure and has been found to emit more than hybrids. Yet. As a sponsor, Toyota has been getting its message across with hydrogen fuel cell cars shuttling Olympic personalities around Tokyo, not to mention the torch, which was fueled by hydrogen for part of its journey. Yes, and this does seem a bit at odds with the market's tilt towards electric cars in recent years. But back to the Olympics itself, is there anything we can salvage from all of this cynicism? Well, I think it's important to point out that Wolf, the sustainability researcher we mentioned earlier, does credit the Tokyo Olympics for trying. He is joined by Masako Konishi, the climate energy project leader at World Wildlife Fund Japan, who points out that the sustainability plans for these games are better than others. 
Konishi notes that the extra electricity required for the Tokyo Olympics will be 100% renewable energy, which includes solar and biomass, setting a good precedent for future events. While thousands of athletes would need to be flown in from around the world, the organizers have obtained more than 150% carbon credits from carbon saving or carbon storing companies to offset all emissions considered. And even though the carbon market system in and of itself isn't a perfect solution, this financial tool has the potential to better regulate emissions while funding projects that help reduce emissions. The price of credits in the European Union has seen a significant increase in recent months, and China has recently entered the market with its national emissions trading scheme, which we've covered in previous episodes. This issue of greenwashing in the Olympics actually reminds me of how tricky it can be to understand environmental issues through the news. The Olympics is a product of developed countries which too often garner a lot of attention in climate news coverage. What's less discussed is the climate news from developing countries, where climate change is more likely to have an immediate effect. Completely agree. This is why, in light of all the extreme weather events of late affecting developed countries, it may be relevant to bring a month-old piece of news that was largely neglected by mainstream media. The V20 Climate Vulnerable Forum, held on July 8th in Dhaka, the Bengali capital. The V20 is a group of 20 vulnerable nations in the Global South, which founded the Climate Vulnerable Forum in 2009. Some of these include nations in Asia, such as Bangladesh, Vietnam and the Philippines, but also in Africa with Kenya and Ethiopia, and Latin America, such as Colombia and Costa Rica. This year's meeting gathered heads of government or finance ministers from 48 countries, including the U.S. International Climate Envoy, John Kerry, the U.N. Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, as well as the president of the World Bank Group. And these representatives discussed ways in which climate change impacts their respective countries. More importantly, the delegates reminded wealthy signatories of the 2015 Paris Agreements of their pledge to limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius and to provide the 100 billion US dollars a year in climate aid to low-income countries. Bangladesh, as the host of the talks, led the way by unveiling the Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan so named after the father of the nation. The plan includes studying climate-related risks and opportunities and making sure they're reflected in decisions made in the public and private sectors. It points to the need to coordinate efforts from different sectors and different systems already put in place to achieve climate goals while developing economically calling for investments in nature and climate resilience. Many of the topics were also brought up, such as the implementation of carbon trading in vulnerable countries and the link between climate change and human rights, which has been a growing issue, especially for island nations who very much feel the effects of rising sea levels. All of this would no doubt require wealthy nations to fund these efforts as pledged in the Paris Agreement. Unfortunately, efforts so far at providing funds towards climate efforts have been wildly inflated based on loose definitions and accounting loopholes, according to an analysis by Oxfam. All this seemed like such an important message to get out. So it was all the more surprising that by mid-July, according to the climate news organization covering climate now, that no major Western news outlets had covered this important meeting except for the Thomson Reuters Foundation, which is the charity branch of Reuters. This same article was then picked up by the Canadian broadcast company and the Daily Mail in the UK. And to think that the organizers of the Climate Vulnerable Forum even held meetings at 10.30 p.m. Dhaka time to make it more convenient for people to stream the event from London to New York. The lack of coverage of this event does not, however, make the messages less important. And it will be interesting to see how wealthy nations respond to it in the coming weeks or months. Koa, let's end on a good note, shall we? Yes, please. It's easy sometimes to feel cynical about human efforts to tackle climate change. So this week, we're turning to Indonesia's recent ban on sane and troll nets. You've probably heard of those infamous huge fishing nets dragged by boats that sweep the ocean floors and catch an absurdly large amount of bycatch and discards. 
Troll nets are notoriously effective at destroying entire marine ecosystems and largely contribute to overfishing in the world. So yes, Indonesia, the second largest fish producer in the world, just behind China, is banning this destructive practice. But it remains to see how effective this ban is going to be this time. Indonesia had already banned it in 2015, but eased the restrictions due to criticism from the fishing industry. Exemptions were granted for the Pantura region in the north of Java, the country's most populous island, and a three-year grace period was given to those fishers to give up their nets. In November 2020, the ban was actually lifted, but this was reversed a week later when the fisheries minister at the time was arrested on corruption charges. This time, however, the new fisheries minister, Satki Wayutringono, reinstated it in full force, no exceptions. Trangono cited concerns for the environment and encouraged fishers to use alternatives and less destructive gear to fish or to switch to fish farming instead. So this is all we have for this week's Green Bites. If you have any news stories that you think we should highlight, let us know on our social media platforms with the hashtag ShareYourBite. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channels for more content and share our podcast with your friends and family. If you are interested in sponsoring Green Bites or have any comments about our content, we would love to hear from you. Email us using communications at sustainableasia.co or drop us a line on social media. Our handle is at sustainableasia. Thanks for listening and see you next week.